Hell yeah, Andre. We bought a Bronco. Roman, how did we buy a Bronco so early? First of all, we didn't get the Bronco Sport. <laughs> None of those little baby Bronco sporty cute thingy things. It's with a truck based with the Bronco. small tires and the little cute little sport name under the Bronco. There's no sport under this one. It's the full on Bronco and better yet, it's the first edition, Andre. And worse yet, it costs $63,000. Ouch. Ouch. But, but still, how did we buy this so early? Because many people are still waiting for their Broncos. Yeah, so I'll tell you that story. Okay. But in this podcast, we're also going to tell you what it's like to own it, what we love about it, what we don't love about it, how it is off-road. Yes. Uh, and, of course, uh, we're going to talk about some crazy videos we're making with it, which you guys will want to see. Uh, so let me tell you how we bought it. Okay. Uh, a couple months ago, I got an email from a guy by the name of Tim who works at McDonald's. And he was a computer savvy guy. And the second the reservation banks opened, yeah, uh, he put in his reservation for the first edition. Yeah, and I know a lot of people tried. Yeah, like I was, was talking, I was he, talking to other people. He's who, a cyber ninja, <laughs> a McDonald's cyber ninja, Andre. <laughs> Some other people tried, and when they clicked, it's like buying uh, concert tickets, right? Yes, it was, yeah, and, and, and it was sold out. Yeah, he right did there. He, he did his magic, and he got one of the first production ones. Okay, uh, and he emailed us, and he said, "Hey, I work for Ronald." McDonald's, uh, and if you guys are willing to do uh, a sponsored video series based on the Ronald McDonald House, which is a great charity, by the way. It's a charity where uh, it's a home away from home for parents of sick kids. So if your kids are sick uh, and they're in the hospital and you've got to stay somewhere, you can stay at the Ronald McDonald House. Uh, if you go to McDonald's and you see that little coin thing yeah. in the drive through that's where that money's going. And he said, if you're willing to do it, I will give you my reservation. Uh, and I said, that is a win-win, my man. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. You are the best. I'm really grateful. Uh, and so he gave up his reservations. We bought it. Uh, and we are now the proud owners of a first edition Cyber Orange, dude, which is kind of yellow, isn't it? Kind of yellowish, but yeah. it's also you know a four door, right? Yeah. It's the it's the, as big as a Bronco can get because it also has a Sasquatch package. It's got everything a, it's as got part every, of the first edition. Every option. Yes, there's nothing it doesn't have. So we're talking lockers, front and rear. We're talking disconnectable sway bar. We're talking that uh, turn assist where you can kind of yes. drag a rear wheel. We're talking heated seats. No, heated steering wheel. Sorry. I think it's heated steering wheel. I, I think everything is heated in this one. It, everything. Everything is there, <laughs> including Sync 4. Uh, and we've already taken it off-road. So if you guys have been following TFL and you go over to TFL Off-Road, we just did our first video uh, where we put it up against our Defender and, of course, the Jeep 4 by And I don't want to go over what happened, but it's a really great video. One of them didn't make it down. Two went up. Only three went up, but only one came down. Two came down. Yeah. Because you left one of them there. We did, yeah. Yeah. But before we move on, we have to thank two more sponsors, right? Yes, we do. So first of all, Patreon supporters. Yes. Uh, you guys who support us using patreon.com slash TFLcar, thank you very much. Uh, we have some recent supporters like Dan Trelmer and Chip Little uh, who are supporting us. Um, also, en Enningban... Uh, I can't pronounce this name. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Enningban. <laughs> uh, we really appreciate it. And if you notice, there are no commercials in these podcasts. And right. that's because of our Patreon supporters. So if you guys want to help support the team, uh, go to TFL Car, Patreon slash TFL Car, uh, and become a supporter. We would love to have you. Uh, we're very grateful for you guys. And uh, it makes what we do uh, that much more fun because we know that there are people listening and watching. Uh, and by the way... Um, this is coming out on Monday. We're recording it on Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the second video where we actually rescue, which is also a great video, where we do the recovery of our Defender will be published on TFL Off-Road. And then today, Tommy actually uh, took the uh, Bronco up a harder trail uh, with a lifted Jeep 392, right? The big, the big yes. yeah, yeah, on 40s and a lifted uh, Defender, because a lot of people in the comments said it's not fair because, well, if you watch the video, you'll see what happened with the yeah. tires. Yeah. So we thought, you know what? Let's take a stock from the factory Bronco and compare it to a lifted Jeep and a lifted Defender. Uh, and that's what he just did today. So that's the third video in the series. So there are three videos. The first two are out on off-road. The third one is coming by the time you're listening to this. Yeah, totally. And also, uh, our uh, one of our partners is Onyx Off-Road Maps. 
Yes. Um, and also, uh, because when we go off-roading like you just described, maps are crucial. Yeah. Because otherwise we get lost, uh, bad things happen. And if you use TFL code, TFL, yep. Yep. you can get 20% off. On an annual membership. Yeah. Yeah, so it, you can load the map, and then when you're out of service, of course, with your cell phone, then you can uh, have full access. They rate the maps. There's a lot of really cool features, so check out Onyx Off-Road Maps. All right, let's talk about uh, the Bronco. Yeah, so uh, you made it sound pretty easy. You said Tim called you, you guys agreed, you bought this Bronco, but it was a little bit more complicated than this, right? <laughs> yeah, it was a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> and the reason it was a lot more complicated was because Ford you know, pulled, originally the Bronco was supposed to have body colored roof, and then of course the whole debacle happened with the Broncos. And there, you know, Bronco production has been delayed, and it's mainly, according to Ford, due to the roof. Uh, they're having problems and different top options yeah, yeah, yeah. Pu putting the top on and that top is made by Wabasto so root and by the way if you guys don't know who Wabasto is it's a German company that makes pretty much every convertible top on the planet in other car. parts in cars other parts yeah in, in trucks yeah. Yeah. they also did a pretty cool electric Mustang they did the uh, electric uh, uh, Wrangler that was in Moab that we featured mm -hmm. not the four by but the pure electric one concept yeah. vehicle uh, anyway uh, so that was a whole to do uh, and then Tim wasn't sure when he was going to get it, uh, but then it all, you know, came together. He, like, we were texting back and forth if even Ford would allow this because he was a reservation holder. I actually went to Ford and I asked Ford, hey, guys, uh, you want to give us one? Uh, because we'll make it the most famous Bronco. We probably will make it the most famous Bronco uh, in America. And they never got back to me, so I, that usually with PR means no. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for Tim for making this happen. And I got to tell you, that the, the picking up the experience, the Bronco at the dealership, he ordered it from a dealership, Phil Long, in uh, the Springs. Um, and uh, picking it up was an interesting uh, thing as well, because we, when we were there, that was the first time I met Tim, the Bronco was parked on the inside and everybody was crawling through it. And of course, Tim uh, loves his cars. He's like a typical car guy where, you know, he wants to be perfect. And sorry, Tim, the Bronco is not perfect. We've already <laughs> trail damaged it. <laughs> well, just the wheels so far, right? Just, but Tommy said it was pretty tight. Oh. So I think there's already some pinstriping on it. But hey, we're using it. That's why we bought it. We, yeah. we didn't. We didn't. And I think Tim wanted us to use it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tim yeah. wanted us. We, we didn't. You know, it's not going to be sitting here in the studio <laughs> <laughs> collecting dust. Uh, anyway, uh, the funniest thing happened, Andre. So you know, I, I do all the paperwork. I sign all the forms. I give them a certified check for actually sixty nine thousand dollars with tax. A big number. Um, I took my breath away. I know some YouTubers are buying Bugatti. Bugattis and Lamborghinis, Aventadors, but it's still, we don't, we don't have those budgets. Yeah, it's still uh, a lot McLarens. of money. I was, you know what? I'll tell you another what? story. What? 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 Uh, uh, we, we, this week, thanks to McLaren, uh, we had a McLaren uh, 720S mm -hmm. at the office, uh, and uh, I was like counting how much money um, all the cars in our office are, and like six cars, new cars, and you, you, you could buy those six cars plus. Have hundred thousand dollars left over for something else? No way. Yeah, yeah. For the price of one McLaren. For the price of that three. Yeah. And, and I, I'm not. I'm not trying to dissuade you from a McLaren. If you've got three hundred sixty thousand dollars, the seven twenty S is not Go ahead. Yeah, fabulous, <laughs> incredible. Uh, it's a head turner. Oh my God, it's a head turner. You so can't, you can't go anywhere. You without can't being, walk no. by this car. No. We we you know our offices are here. I saw people coming out of the dog park yeah. and bike zones and. Just stopping and looking. It's at a this Tiffany car. blue color. It was yeah. like a imagine like a you know like a Jelly Belly <laughs> blue. <laughs> you could see it from space. Yeah, you could. Yeah, it was it was it got a lot of attention. Uh, anyway, uh, Tommy did a video that's coming up, so you can see it on TFL Car. So anyway, so we get the Bronco out of the dealership, uh, and then we're gonna do our first video, which is on TFL Car right now that we just bought the Bronco. And the most hilarious thing happened. I was talking to Tim. We were kind of going. He, he's got a Forerunner, and he was telling me about his Forerunner. Uh, and this couple came up. Really nice couple, right? Um, and uh, uh, they saw the Bronco sitting in front of the dealership. It was open. I was talking to Tim. At this point, it was ours. We had paid for it. Uh, and, the, and the lovely wife looks at her, I guess, husband or boyfriend. I wasn't sure. Uh, and says, you know, instead of buying that Ranger you were thinking about, let's buy this Bronco. <laughs> <laughs> just casually. Yeah, just casually. They just yeah. opened the doors and started crawling through it like it was for sale. So punching all the buttons. Uh, punching all the buttons, opening up all the all of the doors, looking in the back, you know, looking for the key to start it up, I suppose. <laughs> and I was just watching them, and it was pretty hilarious because you couldn't make it. You couldn't write this stuff, right? And then they were having this debate whether they should get the Bronco or they should get the Ranger they came in for. Mm. So I, I suspect they weren't aware that Broncos are relatively hard to get. That was only actually the 
second Bronco that was delivered to the dealership. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I gently went up to her and I went like, yeah, that's uh, mine. I and just bought it. And she was, she was mortified. <laughs> so I, She's like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But that's okay. It was okay. It was, But it was funny. It was just really funny to watch, you know, uh, uh, like having that debate and, and me knowing, of course, that uh, that debate was not going to well, be Well, yeah. I mean, some real. dealers... And some people are marking these up. 20K? Yeah. Um, I think there's one for like 180 on eBay right now. It's insane. Yeah. yeah. So it's not like you can just walk in and buy a Bronco right now. No, no. That is not doable. Anyway, so, uh, you know, then we picked it up uh, and drove it home uh, from the Springs, which is, you know, a two-hour ride up here to uh, Boulder. Uh, and the first thing that is immediately apparent if you're looking at a Bronco is it's big. It's, yes. It's big. I mean, I was next to a first-gen Raptor, and I was as... I was as high and as wide as that Raptor. Uh, it's, it's, you know, a, a Wrangler is a relatively large vehicle. This thing, if a Wrangler is like, let's say, uh, an XL, this is a double XL. Yeah, and I think people don't understand this, but as soon as you see one in person, yeah, um, it's immediately apparent. Uh, something else, I, I have a story for you. Yes, let's hear it. So I was here at the office uh, in the studios, and there was a knock on the door. And actually, it was one of our neighbors here at the offices. Um, and he came by. His name is Jack. He just ordered, he ordered the Bronco a while back. And he was curious about to see it, actually, in person. So I was like, yeah, great. You know, he, he ordered the Outer Banks one, mm-hmm. a two-door. And he walked in the studio garage here. And the first thing he said, whoa, it's big. Yeah, it's big. That's the first thing he said. Well, so, granted, we've got the 35s on ours, yes, which make and any it makes car it look taller. big. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's still, it's a, it's a big old beast. You, you sit very far apart when you're in the Bronco. Yeah, and he also looked at it in the front, and he said, whoa, it's really wide. Yeah. Because it actually, the hood goes, or the grill goes all the way across, basically. So it actually visually and physically it's a very large vehicle. It is. It's a very large yeah. vehicle. Uh, so let's get into it. Let's let's talk about what we love about it uh, and what we uh, found immediately that we don't love about it as much because no car is perfect, Andre. Right. So what I think what I love about it most yes. of all is the color. Oh, yeah, that's cyber. This cyber orange. Is, it's like a very bright yellowy orange. Yeah, it's not truly orange. I mean, I, I was wishing it to, to be a little bit more orange, but still this color is amazing. Jeep, Jeep does this orange called Omaha orange or pumpkin orange as well. It's the exact opposite. Yeah, this is more yellow. Very, if those are very pumpkin color, this is very like yeah. sun, sunlight, you know, yellow, bright color. Totally. And I think the thing looks amazing. And also what looks amazing about it, because of the 35s and because of the Sasquatch package, it looks more proportional. Yeah. You know, sometimes you see the base Broncos on pictures of, you know, they have small tires and they look kind of stretched and long. This doesn't do that. The, the, the big tires make it look proportional. And just fills out the entire, you know, the wheel wells, and it looks awesome. And it's got these really big fender flares uh, that also give it more road presence, right? Because yeah. the, the, the tires are so wide that they stick out past the uh, body. Uh, and, yeah, so it definitely commands the road when you're driving down. And speaking of commanding the road, it's got independent suspension in the front. Uh, and it does drive better on road than, uh, you know, the solid axle Wrangler. And let's face it, this is a direct competitor to the Wrangler. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, much more, I wouldn't say steering feel, but uh, the Wrangler can have up to like a half an inch of like... Little like little, little vagueness. Little yeah. vagueness before yeah. actually something happens. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the Bronco doesn't do that. So on road, it's a little bit better. However, uh, the downside of that is that top is very loud. When you're doing 75 miles an hour... Uh, the top is, uh, you can hear it. You can hear a lot of wind noise coming over it. Do you think it's more than a comparable Jeep? Do you uh, think it's about I, the I, same I, or no, more? I think the, Jeep, I think the Jeep has their top down better. I actually think okay. that the, the top in the Jeep is a little bit more solid. Uh, it's a little bit more, uh, like, well... Insulated. Uh, insulated. Or yeah. But here's the interesting. So our uh, Bronco came with that, you know, carpet on the roof. Mm-hmm. And that's, uh, that's like an added feature that you have to pay for on the Jeep. One of the things that... I think Ford did, which was really smart, and I think it's going to improve the Wrangler as well, is uh, they made, for instance, the ability to have the Sasquatch package on, I think there's six different Broncos you can have, right? Different trim levels. Yeah, you can have it on any trim level. You know, with the Jeep, if you want to get the ultimate off-road one, you have to go Rubicon, and that starts at like like 55, so you can't like 45, yeah. I think it starts at 45. The, The Rubicon? Yeah. I've never seen one. I believe you. I've just never well, seen it. In real life world, <laughs> at, at the dealership, it's probably like 55. But, but you're right. But, but on the website, it says 45. 45. But I've never seen one like that. Maybe if you order yeah. it. Uh, and so it's going to force Jeep to, um, you know, to... Uh, rethink things. Rethink yeah. things, yeah. yeah. And make things that should be standard, like that carpeting on the roof, 
not be an option, you know, and that, that does quiet down the interior. Uh, the other thing that we have in ours, of course, is the uh, 2.7 liter out of the F-150. Yeah, this is a twin turbo V6. Yep. Yes, and at first, when I heard about this, when we were doing original videos, uh, when it was announced, I was thinking to myself, yeah, this is going to be a good, fast SUV because the F-150 is fast, right? Relatively fast. But was it fast? So the F-150, when we first <laughs> tested it, uh, when it first came out, the last generation with the 2.7, yeah. was a rocket, dude. It was a rocket. And so the first thing we did was we took the Bronco off-road, and the second thing we did, and you can go to TFL Cars' YouTube channel, is we drag raced it against the FJ and against the 4xe. Yeah, uh, And that's what right. was our 0-60 to 60 time? Well, it was uh, kind of a, it was a disappointment. It was slow. It was 10.2, I yeah. believe. <laughs> it was your best time. Uh, keep in mind, this is a mile above sea level, oh, right? Yeah. This is Colorado, so you have about 17% less air density up here. So it's going to slow down a little bit. But still, 10.2 seconds, 0 to 60 was slow. It takes a lot of horsepower to roll 35s, especially at a mile above sea level. Yeah, so I was... The Jeep uh, 4 by e was like seven seconds. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the Bronco was uh, three seconds slower. Now, of course, the Jeep Wrangler comes in many more engine choices, right? The Bronco only has two. Yeah. God help you if you had the four-cylinder <laughs> up here. I don't, I don't know what that'd be like. Yeah, um, especially when you buy all, all the options. Like yeah. you said, this is first edition. It's fully loaded. It has, well, all the features are very nice, and it's got like luxurious interior. Well, the seats are pretty nice. The seats are nice. Yeah, uh, that was, that was uh, when we did the video, I, I won't I don't want to wreck my conclusion, but to me, I have I rolled a BMW E36 into a tree a long time ago, and since then, my back has been pretty hosed up. Uh, and so I, I, I cannot tolerate bad seats for very long. Uh, my back just won't do it, especially off-road, right? You know what that's like. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, unfortunately, I think the Wrangler has some pretty um, subpar seats. Uh, and I was so happy when uh, this Bronco came, not only with electric seats, both driver and passenger, uh, but with lumbar. Lumbar support, yeah. yeah. The, you know, the Wrangler's got this yeah. like little hook for the seat adjustment where you pull on this little hook it's really weird this has like traditional knobs and switches so you can move the seat back and forth and the other great thing about the bronco uh, from a tall person standpoint is uh, you can move the seat far enough back with the jeep i'm always like i always feel like my nose is up against the windscreen i could never get far enough back the first thing i do when i get in the jeep is i reach down for the manual uh you know back and, and you forth push and yourself back, back and, and i'm like and it stops i'm like <laughs> come on go farther and it won't go farther yeah no, and I felt the same way, and I think the seat material, especially kind of this this uh, high-end Bronco interior is nice, except some other components, like on the dash. It's weird. Yeah, it's definitely... Uh, it's, in the it's, center console. So here's the weird thing. $63,000, it is not a $63,000 interior, right? There's a lot of plastics, almost a lot of plastics that looks like something that'd be in a prototype, right? The, the, especially like where the cup holders are, that looks like it's almost like unfinished plastic. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, you know, a sixty-three thousand dollar interior would be like a Genesis GV. What is that? Eighty, right? That that is a sixty-three thousand dollar interior. Yeah, it's it feels like leather it, right? and wood and fine metals. Everything nice. Yeah, th this is Ford. <laughs> <laughs> it's Ford. It is. So, it's a Ford, and it is a Ford interior, which which you know isn't isn't bad, except for the price tag. In a forty-three thousand dollar car, no problem. In a thirty-three thousand dollar car, I'd be like, "Oh, okay, that's good." But in a sixty-three thousand dollar car, I'm like, "Whoa, you guys got to step it up." It seems like they spent the money elsewhere. I think they did, um, and I think well, it's lockers, all this stuff, and tires, and axles, and shocks. It has Bilstein shocks, by the way. Yes. So, yeah, but the interior could be better. The, that's bottom line. Yeah, uh, just the m materials. Uh, the design's okay. You know, uh, I'm kind of disappointed that the, that the screen is really big. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's nice. But, you know, coming out of a Mach-E, which has SYNC 5, I'm a little disappointed that they still use SYNC 4. So the difference between SYNC 3 and 4 is like, it's just, you know, I mean, if you love blue, you're going to love SYNC. <laughs> it's all blue, right? It barely yeah, has any blue. colors. And then you get into SYNC 5, and all of a sudden it's like you're using, you know, a completely different interface in the Mach-E. So I, I'm just a little, you know, I'm just like wondering why they didn't use SYNC 5. Remember, SYNC 5 was in the Lightning, too, in the new Lightning. That was right, five. right. Uh, well, I don't know if it's, it's called five. I think it's like four something. It's the one There's that's in the four dot. But it's, it's a four it, dot something. Yeah, completely different interface. And, and it looks a little different. bit more modern and, yeah. and just just cleaner. Yeah. Uh, but still, it's, the screen is huge. It's huge. This is 12, 12 inch screen. And it works, but, yeah. but it's elegant. It is not. But I think, does this, do you know, does this include like over the air updates and all that stuff? 
Uh, well, it's actually connectable to the app, right? So you can monitor the Bronco on the app, which is cool. You can monitor the Bronco. You can do like certain things on the app. Yeah. Does it do over there updates? I don't know. I, I, I'd be talking out of turn. So we'll have to ask for it. Okay. Or uh, Tommy. Or Tommy. He probably would know. Yeah. I know well, the mach -E does over there updates. Well, some, he spent, some things. Tommy spent the most time in this Bronco. <laughs> yeah, Tommy's been living in the Bronco. <laughs> so uh, I haven't had as much of a chance to be in it. Now, the other, other interesting thing about this Bronco, of course, is uh, that uh, basically I think they went and kind of um, – uh, watermarked the Jeep, and then they did everything just a little bit better. Uh, so, like, like you know, the Jeep, and these are things that, that you don't notice in the Jeep until there's a competitor that does them better, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. Uh, two things that, that Ford did, which the Wrangler doesn't do. So in the Jeep, you can actually lock the rear diff in too high, like in a truck. Mm -hmm. Some trucks do that, which is fun because you can go do, like, donuts with it, right? You can, like, do... Like burnouts with it. Sure, or be in the sand or whatever. Or be, yeah, 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 yeah. In, in the Wrangler, you got to be in four low before you can lock. The other thing you can do in the, in the um, Bronco is you can also lock the front diff independent of the rear diff. In the Bronco, you have to lock the rear diff before you lock the front diff. Uh, and that's also it useful. You said it backwards, I think. In, in, the, the, in the Jeep, uh, oh, in the, the Jeep, front yeah. locker is only engageable Engage with the, with the when the rear on. is yeah. engaged. In yes. the Bronco, the, the, you can lock the front independently, independently, which yeah. is useful in, like in the hot tubs if you're in Moab. There are places that that Can you explain hot tubs? Because they're big holes <laughs> in the ground with water on the bottom. And when yes. you want to get out of them, you don't want to get your rear wheels wet and your front wheels wet. So you got to burn off the, uh, uh, the, the water from the rear wheels before you get... Uh, yeah, totally. And it gives you more options, right? Gives you more options. Yeah, yeah. which is really cool. And, and, and that's, yeah, the, I think the technology, especially when you can enable and disable the lockers easily yeah, anywhere. Right. Because I know, I remember, you know, trying to engage that or, you know, even in a Tacoma, like a Toyota Tacoma, you have to be on level ground, you know, to engage four low yeah. and all this stuff. Bronco doesn't care. It just kind of does it. Yeah, yeah. It just You just push a button and, and, and Tommy uses that a lot. It also has uh, kind of this thing that Toyota, I think, pioneered, where it locks the inside wheel uh, and makes, lets you make a much tighter turn. I'm not sure that's great for the trail because you're basically dragging the inside wheel, uh, but it does allow you to make a much tighter turn. And we did use that going up Red Cone. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's just software. Uh, so you Pretty know, much because you're, yeah. uh, you're activating the brakes. Yeah, yeah. And it, of course, has uh, this little round dial called GOAT mode, right, which stands for goes over any terrain. Uh, and then you could you could pick different uh, drive modes, so like rock crawl, uh, ice, sand, snow, mud. Sand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, it, and it basically uses the electronics to try to send power. But you can also just manually lock everything up, which is great. You got you got both choices. Yeah, and what uh, something else I like about the Bronco is it's kind of modular, right? So the bumper we got was kind of this upgraded bumper. You can, you know, it has separate pieces. It has also kind of a push bar up front in yeah. front of the grill. Apparently, when they first designed it, it wasn't tall enough and it covered up the Bronco. I know it completely erased yeah. the, the letters or was in front of the letters, and then they redesigned it and made it higher. And you can take the end caps off to get better approach angles. Yeah, and that's what I mean, kind of modular, right? And then the roof comes off in, in actually three four seconds. pieces. No, no, yeah, two in the front and one in the back. One in the back, and then the rear. Uh, section comes off too. We have yet to take the roof off, so we're going to be doing that next well, week. But you water tested it, actually. We did, yeah. I, I yeah. yeah it, it, one of the things that uh, um, they watermarked, <laughs> bookmarked, watermarked, was that, the, of course, it's got removable doors, yeah. uh, and with the Jeep, the problem is you remove the doors, you remove the, um, the mirrors, The, the right? mirrors, yep. With the Bronco, they're actually attached to the A-pillar. So you can remove the doors. And because they didn't want them to be as heavy, they made them frameless, mm -hmm. which on one hand is good. On the other hand, when you close the door, it feels a little flimsy, right? Because mm -hmm. the window just comes kind of mm -hmm. because there's nothing holding it in place on top. And we will be doing that. And I, I believe we'll be working with our friends at Best Stop uh, to actually get a soft top for it for the summer. So I can't wait. So thank yeah. you, Best Stop, for working with us. And also very different in the Bronco from the Jeep Wrangler. Uh, in the Jeep, you have kind of the center... A hoop that goes over where the driver and passenger seat where the, where sit, the where the speakers sit. are. Uh, basically, the B pillar, right? Yeah. It's kind of a roof structure. The Bronco doesn't have it, so when you take the roof off, it's actually a clear area all the way across from the front row to the back row. Uh, but also, have you tested like the stereo? Does the stereo sound Sounds, good to we, you? We've got the upgraded stereo. It sounds really good. Tommy okay. said it wasn't as good because you didn't have those speakers behind your head because yeah. of that hoop is not there. 
but at least with the top on, it sounds really good. Okay, this is B and L system. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's 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 for it's a premium uh, stereo. Yeah. Uh, the other cool thing is it does have a disconnectable sway bar, but unlike the Jeeps, it's uh, I want to say electric versus whatever Jeep is. Something uh, hydraulic. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so, like the Jeep one, always has issues either disengaging or engaging. Right? You have to be in like in, in like once you said in a certain flat. position. Yeah. Yeah. And this one does it whenever you do it, which is nice. And and Ford says it's got more articulation, but in our red comb video, if you watch it, you find that it probably doesn't. The yeah. Jeep still has more. I mean, a solid axle is just going to have more. I don't know what Ford was referring to, but it's visually you could see it. You could see that the, 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 the Wrangler has more articulation. Uh, the other nice thing is, I, and I don't know. I mean, there's a part of me that like loves that lever in the Wrangler that engages first, you know, too high to four high or four auto, and then four low. But it's always quite a struggle. It's never with with the Bronco. You just push a button. With the Ford, you're like pulling on that lever, and then. <laughs> Pushing on the, uh, you know, with the so it's more physical. I mean, it could be good, right? It's kind of it's very manly, manly, but But, sometimes it gets old. Sometimes not functionally as efficient, (laughs) if I I could say it that way. (laughs) But manly, (laughs) but manly, yes. You put on a big lever, Andre. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And then how about towing, Andre? What's the towing? So they're the same. Actually, (laughs) they're the same. So the Jeep uh, four door, the unlimited Jeep Wrangler, is rated at thirty five hundred pounds. And the Bronco is the same. They rated it identically, uh, 3,500 pounds. Although, like I said, it's got a frame. It's similar. A fr- the frame is very similar to the Ranger. It's got an F-150 engine, yep. uh, 10-speed automatic. Yep. So you would think it could tow a house down the 300 road. 300 plus horsepower, 305, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, you would think it would tow a house down the road, but no. I, uh, I, the, the soft suspension and all the other limitations. And you know, the biggest limitation, I think, is payload. Yes, that's a huge limitation. Yeah, both the Wrangler and the Bronco have really poor payload. You, you know me, how much I care I about payload. I know because payload is about how much stuff, you know, how big of a dog do you want? Do you want a purse <laughs> dog or do you want, like, Blaze, a Bernese Mountain Dog? Because with these vehicles, you're going to be with a purse dog. Yeah, so the first thing I did, well, not the first thing, but maybe the second thing I did with our Bronco when I first saw it here at the studio when you guys brought it here, I opened the door and I looked at the payload sticker. Do you remember what it said? It wasn't a lot. I want to say it was just over a thousand pounds. It was nine hundred and twenty pounds. Oh, Roman! Wow, that's uh, that's so. That's so four of us, four of us, and a and a purse dog. <laughs> Me, you, Nathan, and maybe Tommy and a purse dog. <laughs> yes, and that's not towing anything. No, or yeah. hauling any gear. Or hauling anything, yeah. So, so, so that's the trade-off. Uh, you know, they always market big numbers, right? Yeah. You know, 1,400 pounds of payload and blah, 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 blah. But as soon as you, you know, add all the features, you add all the stuff, uh, the payload comes down. But I don't know if it matters. I don't think a lot of people are going to be towing heavy, yeah. you know, with this thing. Um, it's not really meant for that. Maybe a little off-road trailer that you can bring with you. Um, so, but the payload is always important because people put big roof racks, right? Maybe a rooftop tent. Yeah. And that all matters, right? Yeah. You know, like I say, I think, you know, people who tow for a living certainly know a lot about payload. I think the rest of people probably just, you know, stuff it full of stuff and don't worry <laughs> and about it. And just go. Just go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, why is this thing so slow? <laughs> or why am I, why is it bumpy? Because yeah. you're riding on your bump stops because the thing is squatted. Uh, so yeah, the, the 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 payload isn't grand. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about it, and, I, and I'm not in love with this, it's okay. But the first edition has these like uh, blue purplish uh, seats, and it's kind of Broncos color. If we're being honest, right? It's orange. Yeah, Denver and Broncos football. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. But you know, I think they call it like the uh, what is it like m- marine motif, like yeah. n- nautic nautical motif. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but so if you're if you're a Denver Broncos fan, you're gonna love ours. Yes, <laughs> which I am. Yeah. So yeah. when it's when it's time to sell it, I'm sure we're gonna have a lot of hand raisers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but in general, I, I think that you know it's it's it, 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 you know is it better than a Wrangler? Uh, no, I don't think it's better than a Wrangler. Uh, but is it as good as a Wrangler? Yeah, it's as good. Uh, it really depends, you know. I mean, I mean, the, the the issue right now, Andre, is the Wrangler has been around a long time, and style-wise, it's looked the same since you know the original Willys, uh, and the Bronco has been out of the market for a long time. So there's a, just a lot of excitement right now. I think they're going to steal a lot of sales away from from Jeep. Or the other thing that might happen is, and this is also a case that's pretty common, where you know more vehicles in that segment don't necessarily steal 
sales from the competitor, but you know the rising tide raises all boats, so it, it somehow increases the segment. So maybe more people will be getting out of uh, Forerunners or uh, well, actually, they, or, or other vehicles, yeah, or Rav Fours maybe, or like Highlanders. Maybe yeah, people maybe will Highlanders, be ditching Highlanders, maybe Outbacks, yeah. right? Uh, because because you know it is the new kid on the block. It, it is probably uh, out of the ten years, eleven years we've been doing this. I don't know of any vehicle with more excitement around it except maybe the Cybertruck. But the Cybertruck is not doing here. No, it's not even yeah. here yet. Yeah. yeah, but this is truly a lot of excitement. Uh, people want to know everything about it. We just got like two emails in the last hour, people asking about cargo capacity. And I can tell you this four-door Bronco? has a lot of room. More fits, room than a Wrangler, yeah. Yes, fits two Andres in the, in the cargo area. Because I was able to sit there, and I still had room for another you know, person in that cargo area. And it also fits four doors. Right, you can take off the doors, put them in bags. Yeah, they're module, and we get bags with it, and then they, then they actually stack up in the back. Yeah, so it's really useful like that. I can't wait to take the top off and the doors off. We'll be doing that next week. This week, we're still too busy just <laughs> trying to figure out what it is and, uh, and what it isn't. Yeah. Uh, but on the trail, you know, the bigness of it is gets in the way, right? It feels more Hummer-like than Wrangler-like. So the Wrangler feels a little bit more nimble. Well, it is a little bit more nimble. It's a little bit narrower. It, it kind of, and, and why that's important is because... Uh, we find out with the Defender, if you're a little bit narrower, you have more choices of what line to take. Whereas if you're very wide, there's only one line, and that's the line that, like, you know, threads the needle. Mm -hmm. Versus, like, going around an obstacle, you have to go over an obstacle. And, of course, 35s help, as they we help, saw. Yeah. And as you can watch on our TFL Off-Road channel, uh, I think the ground clearance, suspension, lockers help the Bronco tackle that stuff. But, like, I, I like your analogy, actually, with the Hummer a little bit because, you know, the, the hood is big. Yeah. You get into the thing. And, but those um, little um, tie-down points on the hood. I call them gun sights. They look like gun yeah, sights. Yeah, like little gun sights kind of tell you brilliant. where the vehicle is. For whoever came up with that was brilliant. Those things are so cool. Yeah. Right? They're, a little, they're supposed to be a little tie-down. So if you want to, like, put a canoe on the roof. You can tie it down to the hood, basically. Or if you're in the jungle and you want to put, like, a wire <laughs> so that, like, branches don't come and hit your wind, windshield. Yeah. Uh, th th those are really, really cool. So, But uh, it kind of places the fenders. Yeah. Uh, um, it's like in a race car, you know, when you're looking at the front and you know exactly where your vehicle is or your front wheels are. That's kind of what it does for you. Uh, and it helps during parking, you know, when you're parking it or going around town. And in this case, it also helps off-road a little bit. So I was just in L.A. Uh, reviewing the new Audi uh, e-tron GT and RS. Okay. Uh, and I was staying at this very uh, shishi hotel, thank you, Audi, uh, off of Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood called the Pendry. Uh, and every morning I get up and there would be like Rolls Royces and uh, McLarens and Lamborghinis parked in front, right? So I was curious. I was like, I walked up to the valet and I said, hey, if I drove up here with a Bronco, uh, would you park it in the front or would you put it someplace in the back? And I thought he would say, I'd put it in the front. But he was like, a Bronco compared to a Rolls-Royce Wraith convertible? Probably in the back. I don't know, but, though. Did he know what the Bronco really Yeah, I don't know if means. he knew what it was. I, I was expecting him to say, hell yeah, I'd put a Bronco up here. But there was a kid who was parking cars who was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'd put it up here. But, like, the ma main uh, valet dude was like, eh, I'm not Maybe sure Maybe he was that. thinking, like, Bronco from the 90s. I, well, he said classic <laughs> Bronco. So he was thinking, like, oh, like okay. old first-generation Bronco. And I was like, yeah. no, no, no. Which is no, funny because no. the valet would, should know cars, right? If there's one position the, where where you would know cars, that would be it. All right, Andre, now we did take the Bronco versus the Defender versus the new um, plug-in hybrid Jeep Wrangler 4xe up Red Cone. Yep. Uh, and uh, something interesting happened. What's that? Um, you scratched the wheels? Well, we did that too, yeah. Sorry, sorry, oh. sorry, Jim, Paul, Jeep. Okay, <laughs> what else happened? <laughs> sorry, guys. What else happened? Well, that was, okay, for, well, first of all, I didn't scratch the wheels. Okay. Uh, uh, Tommy, Scratched him a little bit, and then Nathan, like, full-on scratched him. <laughs> you know, Nathan, 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 there's a Nathan approach to off-roading, which is kind of the spinal approach to, to the guitar, right? It goes to 11. <laughs> <laughs> so Nathan likes to use momentum to get up and over things. And there was one part, which I call the gatekeeper, this rock, where if you use momentum, it slammed you into another rock. So um, sorry about that, Jeep. Didn't mean to do that. Uh, but if you want to make an omelet, you know what you got to do. Well, Jeeps are meant for off-roading, yes. and that's exactly how we use them. Right, yeah, I mean. Um, and we, the video is amazing. And you can take the, you know, like, I guess you could take, you know, the top off, because this was a soft top, pull it back, and go get some ice cream with it. But, you know, we're here in Colorado, and if you give us a Jeep, expect In the us, summer. Uh, yeah, expect us to do Jeep things with it. Yeah, so it is a plug-in hybrid. Yes. It so has a 17-kilowatt-hour battery. Yes. 
and Nathan and you guys, uh, and I wasn't there, so I, I really wanted to be there, but it didn't work out. Um, you tested the off-road range of the Jeep, right? But first, Nathan tested the on-road range. So Jeep oh. claims uh, an on-road range of all-electric, on-road, 21 miles. And then That's Nathan, rating. Yeah. Nathan took it on our standard loop, uh, and he actually got 27 miles. Which is really impressive. And yeah. this is a combined loop, city and a bit of highway, right? Uh, yeah, ours is kind of weird. So the first, city. the first part is all city and kind of like country road. So I don't, think, I don't know if he even got to the highway part. At, I don't think he got to the highway part at 27 miles. But it a lot of people later. live in cities, so that's kind of, you know, yeah, typical. Yeah, yeah it's, typical. It's, it's really good. Uh, and then uh, we did this twice, so because I wasn't sure of the results, the number was so staggering. I, I was like, "Oh, gee, this is really weird." So we did it twice. So we took it up red cone. Me and Tom did it once, and that video is still being edited, so that'll be up there as well in all electric mode because we were curious, what's it like, you know, to actually go off roading when you're all EV? Uh, and of course, we measured the distance. Uh, so how far do you think we went in all electric mode? Uh, oh, you know the answer. Well, I know the answer, but. Well, because I've been studying this, because when you told me, and I also wrote a story about this. Yes. Um, and I was shocked uh, when you first told me. But uh, I think, believe you got at first 3.4 miles. Yep, 3.4 miles. And then Nathan got 3.1 miles. Yeah, well, like I say, he goes to 11. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but um, you, I think both of you guys started not with 100% battery, but like 92 or 93%. Yeah, you so can't. So it was you, almost full. Yeah, you can, there's three buttons on the 4xE. There is like hybrid, uh, and the one we're using is called eSave. So you can save the battery until you get to the trail. Uh, and uh, so that's what we did. But it, it always gives you like not 100%, like 95%. So we had maybe had like 95, Nathan had 93 when we started. So that makes sense. Um, yeah. Besides the fact that Nathan goes to 11, which is great, Nathan, love that, but it's it is what it is. Uh, anyway, so um, the issue there, of course, Andre is. But before I get to the issue, it's wonderful off-roading in electric mode. You can yeah, hear, tell me about it because I haven't really experienced it. It's so cool. You you pull the top back and you can hear the babbling brook. You can hear the birds. You hear the you know the suspension working. It's a completely different experience. You know what? Be like it's like the exact opposite of a side by side because side by sides. For some reason, are super loud and have those like some of them have those thumpers, right? Yeah. Or the ones, the, you know, the ones, the, the one cylinder engines, and they're just like you know, like farty. <laughs> they don't exactly sound good, right? No. And it's just you, know, you hear it's like. And, all then, the time. and then they're very fast and yeah. it's just crazy. Yeah. yeah. In the Jeep, you're like at one with nature. You feel like you're you're communing with the great outdoors, and you're listening for birds and brooks and wind and butterflies and you know it, it's really nice not scaring the little woodland creatures <laughs> so the marmot when when the marmot popped up he was just waving to you i guess as you drove by yeah he gave me a thumbs up a little, <laughs> little marmot thumbs up <laughs> whereas when i came by in the bronco he scurried away <laughs> uh and uh so that's the wonderful part, but the, the, the scary part is, and I, you know, I was trying to tell some other automotive journalists about this, and, and nobody seems to uh, like take this very seriously, because I think we're one of the few publications who like, do serious off-roading and serious towing. So you know, when, we, when we initially had our Tesla Model X, right, I took it up a mountain, and we wanted to turn it into an off-roader, but we found out that we couldn't because you couldn't even put like, serious off-road tires on it. If you can't put off-road tires on it, everything else is a joke. Uh, but I did take it up with the tires, and Tesla gives you a really great graphic that tells you how much power you're using. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that I was using as much power or more going up this mountain as we were towing with it. So crawling up a mountain off-road in a Tesla, it was using about the same amount of energy as towing a big trailer up a mountain. Or more. Yeah, or, or more. more, yeah. Because you think about it, the problem with electric vehicles is that they're heavy, and you're going up a steep mountain, so you're dragging. You can't change physics. You're dragging all this weight up a mountain uh, and uh, you know when we did that video I was terrified of starting the local forest on fire because I was afraid of like it has air suspension in the Model X so I was afraid of like like dropping the battery on a pointy rock and you know breaking the battery cage which would be bad because then you would start a fire that wouldn't go out till you were in jail but but in the Jeep it's different right because this Rubicon it's protected uh, they have a big it, skid it's, plate it's a true Rubicon yeah. so this electrified Jeep this plug-in um, it's just has an electric motor in the battery, which is kind of uh, protected inside the vehicle, but it has the same skid plates and the same axles and the same tires and 
rock sliders as any other Jeep, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But the, but the part that is eye-opening and the part that like people, and I still think people don't quite understand how much towing will be affected uh, when you have an electric vehicle, how much towing affects an electric vehicle. It basically cuts it down by um, two-thirds. So if mm-hmm. you can go 300 miles when you're towing, and I'm not talking about towing heavy, I'm talking about towing like 3,000 pounds, you're going to be able to go 100 miles. And that, that sounds like, okay, so my range has been cut down by two-thirds. But then the other thing that happens when you do that is all of a sudden, instead of charging like from 20% to 80% to get you if you're driving cross country, you have to charge from 0% to 95%. Which and, takes a long and that, time. Yeah, and that, that, that like triples your charging time. So yeah. there's a whole bunch of knockoff consequences that happen when, when you're towing. Uh, and and I, I think people will finally like um, get a sense for that when, when the Rivian is out uh, and when the Lightning comes out and when the Cybertruck comes out. Anyway. Speaking of those three, if you extrapolate the 17-hour kilowatt battery to three miles of range off-road, and you, let's say you've got a 100 kilowatt hour battery, so you you multiply that by five, right? You end up with 15 miles of range off-roading. And when the Jeep, it doesn't really matter, right? Because when the battery died, uh, the engine kicked on and we just kept going. But what happens if you're out there uh, and you know, your battery's dead. You're not going to plug that Rivian Cybertruck Lightning into a tree. Uh, and I know Jeep and Rivian are putting chargers uh, next to trailheads, trailheads yeah. but these are level two chargers, Andre. You're looking at, you know, probably 10 miles of range, if you're lucky, in an hour of charging. So and I that's not off-road right? that's on-road right? Exactly. And, and I did all these calculations on tfloffroad.com. Yes. So because I looked at uh, Rivian, uh, I calculated on a big pack. Because Rivian is promising like about 180 kilowatt hour battery for their most highest range uh, truck and SUV. I think just for the truck, um, and that turns into you know if you extrapolate, if all things being equal, right, yes. climbing a tough mountain at crawling speeds, a Rivian truck could go about 36 miles with a big battery. With a big battery, the Hummer truck yeah. with a bigger battery, uh, because Hummer we estimate that battery at about 200 kilowatt hours could go about 40 miles. And I wrote this down and I published a story, this was several days ago, and several of you have commented. And you also reminded me, because I temporarily forgot, that remember um, in the recent Baja race, in the San Felipe race, yeah. Lordstown entered, yeah. remember? And they ran out of juice. And they ran out of juice about 40 miles into the race. Yeah. So this estimation, about 40 miles, matches what Lordstown saw. So during hard off-road use, that range is cut down a lot. So, so what, what we're saying here is it's going to take like three weeks to run a Baja 1000 <laughs> in an electric vehicle. Yes, if you bring a semi with generators. This is what, this is what ha- there's a race that our friend Emmy did, right, the Rebel Rally last year. It's an all-woman's, uh, uh, it's not really a race, it's a, it's a, a navigation trial. It's rally, a navigation yeah. kind of time trial thing, yeah. Uh, and she she ran the Rivian, uh, and they brought this semi truck with this huge trailer that had solar panels on the top, which is cool. Yeah. But what they also had inside was massive, I think, diesel uh, generators, generators <laughs> to to charge up the Rivian. And so if you can have one of those follow you around, you'll be set. <laughs> uh, then you guys may be thinking to yourself, yeah, but that's driving up you know a very steep mountain with kind of low traction. The other time that think about this, the other things that people do off road that's very popular is sand, and sand uses even more sand dunes. Yeah, yeah sand sand is is incredibly power because you're going faster, and you're spinning your tires. You're using more power. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, think about a sand rail, right? A sand rail is just, you know, this basically like uh, you know tube frame with the biggest engine possible in and it. paddle wheels and paddle wheels. Yeah, it, it just uses giant, yeah. tens amounts of power. It's like a powerboat, right? That's another bad use for electricity. It's boats because yes. those use tons of power. You know, there's well. one electric ski boat I was looking at. Yeah, all electric. Wow. I believe I believe it was. Uh, I want to say it was a Malibu. Yeah. It was by Malibu, and they pr- they were promising three hours of water skiing on one charge, That's which a sounds one. a lot. But then they said, oh, by the way, this boat costs about three hundred thousand dollars. Wow. So I I you know. There's no way I will ever get the boat like this. Are, are you angling to start TFL boat? Is that what you want? <laughs> you want to get that thing to test out there on Horse dude, Reservoir? Dude, we just went to the Frontier event, and they had boats everywhere. Yeah. Just boats, boats, boats. Yeah, and if, by the way, uh, if you're interested in the new Frontier, head over to our other 
uh, podcast, uh, TFL, TFL talking truck. truck, yeah, yeah. talking trucks, uh, where we where we deep dive <laughs> into the new frontier. So I don't know, Andre. You know, I'm uh, kind of ambivalent right now. I feel like uh, uh, people don't quite uh, yet have a full picture of the limitations. And I love electric vehicles. Look, we've owned pretty much, I think, almost a dozen of them now because I think they are definitely the future. Uh, but there are just some applications that with the current technology, it's going to be a little challenging. And so so there's this like weird counter position that's happening right now. And I, I'm really curious as to how this is going to get resolved. So I was, I was listening to our friends over at Inside EVs, their podcast, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they were, they, they kind of delved deep into that story uh, with uh, the Ford Lightning, you know, uh, one of the guys there got to actually drive it. Uh, I Not know, drive ride, it, ride, ride, ride it. it. Yes. But, but he saw the screen where it said that it had 500 miles of range potentially, which would be incredible. Um, uh, but uh, but the, the, the dichotomy that I don't understand, and and let's face it, that's Inside EVs is kind of a electric vehicle fanboy, right? If you're doing Inside EVs or if you're doing GM Authority or if you're doing, you know, uh, Ford Nation, right? You're probably like cheerleading part of the way that Bronco Nation, Bronco Nation, <laughs> yes. or Ford Nation, right? You, <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm not. So, that, that's a commercial site, but I'm saying even in a, as an editorial website, these sites because they have people who are um, fans of that brand do a little bit of cheerleading, right? Uh, uh, and so one of the one of the guys on the podcast was saying that you know he thinks. Uh, that and this is this is very smart. He thinks that you know they've got 120,000 reservations for the new Ford F-150 Lightning, mm -hmm. uh, and that even if you know if 10% of the current buyers see a use case uh, for that truck, that, that that truck will be a hit. And he might be right because they sell so many trucks. Yeah. But the dichotomy that I think people have yet to address, and, and I, maybe I hope I'm wrong. I really hope I'm wrong. Is uh, there's going to be a lot of compromises that are going to have to be made with electric trucks. Uh, the first and foremost one is towing. Range is going to go. The second one is off-roading. And right. the third one that nobody seems to talk about is like, where do you park them? Right? You, you will not put a full-size truck. And I, and I rode in the Cybertruck. It's big. That will not fit in your garage. Un unless you're a millionaire and you've got some hangar or some, you know. Or big garages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Will, that will not fit in a typical house garage. Uh, and, and people somehow seem to kind of gloss over this. So even if you say 10% of the people are going to be fine with the limitations, where are you going to park it? Yeah, and so, well, first of all, we listen to a lot of other podcasts. Yes. And, and, you know, I have a lot of respect to what the guys at the Inside AV do. I love their podcast. Yeah, uh, yeah, because they also do range testing, right? They do they range do. testing. They, 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 they drive them on the highways, on roads, et cetera, et cetera, which is really awesome. Um, but like you said, so there will be limitations. Also, charging networks are limitations, right? And also, um, they also did a podcast about how you know the surcharges for for peak charging right so if several trucks arrive at the same charge station and all of them draw power right it spikes the power energy usage in that station and they have to pay incredible amount of money right for that yes yeah, the, the utility the yes. utility company yeah so that's also an issue um so i don't think um electric will be an end all solution for everything right there'll be other use cases and for many many years in the future where gasoline and diesel will have to be sub, you know, will have to supplement or at least be in this market as well. Yeah, look, look, um, you know, I, I have this conversation, and I heard it again on their podcast. I have this conversation with a lot of automotive journalists, right? And I had it, I just had it with um, somebody at this uh, Audi event, right? Where the first thing they'll say, because it was all electric people, right? The first thing they'll say is most people who buy trucks will never even tow with a truck. They don't ever, they don't like haul hay with it, right? Uh, and uh, I'm not sure about that, Andre. Uh, you know, we've well, done a series of videos, you know, here's what real name farmers, ranchers, ranchers. cowboys drive, right? Uh, and uh, if you're, look, if you're, a, if you're a electric vehicle fan or if you're into electric vehicles, chances are you live in a city. That just because most people live in a city, it's just statistically. And, and it kind of makes sense. Uh, if you have an electric car, not a truck, electric car, and you live in a city, stop and go, stop and go. Yeah. You got region breaking. Yeah. You're using not the slow. You know, you're not driving at 75 miles an hour. You're driving at slower you can, you speed. You can park it in your, you know, garage. 
It's right. a very small car, it's a very potentially. Small, usually, or if it's a big car, it still fits in a, in a garage. Yeah, it's easy. It it's, makes there's sense. Not a high, it, there's not a height right. restriction. Uh, and so when I, whenever I hear like somebody you know, in the in electric vehicle world say, well, most people who have trucks never use it as a truck. I just, you know, first of all, they'll say most person who, have a, who, who own a truck will never use a car as a truck. And I'm like, I just cringe, right? Because <laughs> you, you can always tell like truck guys and gals because they call their truck trucks. Car guys and car gals call their trucks cars. Yeah. Uh, and that was a mistake we used to make. And then, you know, 10 years of living and, and breathing. And trucking. And trucking, <laughs> we've, we've learned. So thank you guys for pointing that out. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I think people in the EV world don't quite appreciate just how much of a tool it, a truck is, right? A, a truck is like any, it's like a car, right? People have, some people have it because they love it, because it's a family hauler. Some people love it because it's a classic vehicle. Some people love it because, you know, uh, it's very performance oriented. I'm talking about things like the Raptor mm -hmm. and the TRX, uh, you know, vehicles like that. Uh, and some people have it as just their everyday vehicle, but a lot of truck guys and gals use a truck as a tool uh, and that's when you run into this like dichotomy and contradiction where all of a sudden the electric stuff starts to become a little problematic so so i don't know here's another thing okay yeah. here's another thing so ford and, and maybe as a journalist i was always taught to be a little skeptical uh, that's my job right so so that's kind of the, the way i am as a person in general and from a business standpoint it would be better if we were out here like cheerleading the industry but but that's not me, and I don't think that's TFL. I think you know right. we, you know our well, job. I think we're a realist. Well, I you think know, our job is to hold the manufacturers accountable for what they say, mm -hmm. and that's getting harder and harder because most you know serious publications are going by the wayside, uh, and what's left is a lot of influencers and people that basically are trying to make a living at this or sponsorships or by spon manufacturers. Yeah, sponsorships. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. much harder to hold a manufacturer accountable because then you're actually in a very uncomfortable position, right? It's much easier to say, hey guys, you know. The lightning is the best thing since sliced <laughs> yeah, bread. It's gonna get 500 miles of range. I'm not sure about that, but it looks like it. I'm not sure, you know, we're just, but it probably does, you know. That's much easier and a more more gentle way of, of, of approaching yeah. Ford PR. <laughs> but where I was going with this is, yeah, so my job as a journalist is to be skeptical. Uh, and so, um, I'll give you an example of that, Andre. Uh, I was, I'm, I, I, once again, I don't want to call people out, so I'm not going to tell you where I was, but we were at a dealership mm -hmm. uh, where, where uh, we were talking to one of the salespeople, and that salesperson uh, had ordered um, uh, three of the hottest new vehicles. Okay. Three. 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 Yeah, yeah, because he said. Personally uh, or personally, as a dealership? Yeah, per he said he ordered three of the hottest new vehicles. I'm not going to go what vehicle it is, they're just hot vehicles, because he said that he wasn't sure what color. He wanted. Yeah, wanted, yeah. Now, now, if I, being a journalist, being me, I'm thinking to myself, if I'm a dealership and I've got a hot vehicle, I'm going to order as many as Ford will allow me, and then I'm going to have my salespeople order as many as possible, and then, you know. And I'll sell them. If, if, they, if, they, if the salespeople cancel their orders, so, you know, 120,000 orders for the Lightning, let's say. I'm not saying it's the Lightning. Uh, you know. <laughs> How, how much well, of that is yeah. like is like actual people raising their hands and putting hundred dollars down, and how much of it is like you know the, the kind of the the, the stuff that dealerships do to to maximize their profits? I don't so, know. I, so I don't know. I but these things are happening. I, I agree. So wow, how much time do we have, Roman? Because I wanna I wanna respond a little bit. Yeah, you here. got you got time. Go for uh, it. A couple things. So first of all, trucks are regional too. So you and I were in Chicago at the Chicago Auto Show, and we drove to the airport and some other areas uh, in Chicago. And, and you asked me, how many pickups do you see, Andre? And I, I didn't see many. You know, maybe we saw two or three, and they were all working. There was one truck with ladders on it and stuff like that, and another truck was pulling a U-Haul trailer. If you go to Denver, <laughs> almost every other vehicle is a truck. Or right? Houston or Dallas. Or Houston or Dallas or you know, somewhere, you know, somewhere else out west. When we were in Utah at the Nissan program, looking at, at the lake, right, and people coming in with boats, there was 100% trucks, right? Because people need those vehicles to bring their families and their boats and their stuff and all kinds of stuff um, to, to the lake. So I think it's regional, first of all. And I, I don't think electricity will solve every need, right? Every, every need. So, so th th that's one. And also, you're talking about the reservations, right? You know, when Cybertruck came out, they said, 
you know, a million reservations or whatever. Um, so there's two things there. And I was just reading a story about this, too, where the industry is basically changing right now. Um, first of all, $100, right? You have to submit. That's a hand raiser. Uh, it's a hand raiser. But before this, let's, let's rewind like five years. Uh, manufacturers considered hand raising when you clicked send me an email update on a page. Mm-hmm. And, they, and they also talked about those numbers. You know, let's say the new Ford Ranger is coming out, and this was several years ago. And we have 300,000 hand raisers. That was people clicking a link. So now we moved up to people actually paying $100, which is another next step, right? And it depends on the manufacturer. So I think, you know, it's 100 bucks and it's refundable. Um, with Tesla, they, got, they went away from the refundable. Rivian was twenty five hundred dollars. I mean, it depends that's on the very, manufacturer. That's huge. Yeah. So, so that's changing, right? So, that's a little bit more serious, right? And not, not every person will be able to reach in, you know, pull out a credit card and say, "Here, I'll give you a hundred dollars for a couple months or six months or whatever." So that's sizable. Well, well, but, well, but, 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 but also, just one more thing. Yeah, so, of course. So, so, so also, um, and there was a story about Ford recently that they're moving into this build to order thing so they're not going to just build vehicles f- to stock the dealerships anymore so and that's not going to happen overnight this is going to happen over several months or years so this, this um, is the way it works in europe right you yeah don't, you don't go but uh, andre uh, gosh what you know, I, I have this thing where it's a good it's a good point but there's a reason that dealerships like Johnson's where we buy a lot of our uh, vehicles has 500 trucks sitting on, on the lot. It's not because the dealer wants to sit on 500 dealers, I promise you, right? That's all money that is out of their pocket, right? That's that's those that's are, a huge investment. Th- those are trucks that are sitting there waiting waiting for the next hailstorm to come in. <laughs> and destroy them. And be destroyed, yeah. yeah. I don't think a dealer wants to sit on, but there's a reason why. Uh, and so when Ford says, well, we're gonna be, we're gonna suit to order, uh, they may get some pushback from their dealers because their dealers are at the front line selling vehicles. And I, they know, I think so. And they know in America, like you go to buy a vehicle, you do not want to come back with uh, a reservation form saying it'll arrive in three months. It's just, that's not, we're not like that, dude. We are, you know, we are very I much. I want it right now. Or let's say you had an accident, right? Your vehicle was damaged. It, exactly. You're going to the dealer. You have to replace that vehicle today. You need to go to work. Yeah, we've got to work in America. Not not a month from now. <laughs> you know what? I, I love the fact that uh, you have a white uh, rogue, but I want a red one. So uh, I'm just gonna call my employer and say, "Hey, I'm not gonna be there for the next month until so I, my made-to-order rogue." Co- it just not, that doesn't work yeah. here. Yeah. So so yeah. So there's many things happening so, here. So I, I think uh, with COVID, everything's gotten uh, you know turned around. Like there's 16 cars now. I was just watching a, a, a press release today. Uh, car prices are up 35 percent. Andre, I think that is in truck prices. I think that is an unsustainable bubble. I think absolutely. I, I think at some point that's going to pop uh, because uh, people just can't live with those. You know, you, you can't just be taking out 10-year loans when year four you're upside down. I mean, there's got to be a price there, and the price is going to be a lot of people. Uh, having their vehicles repossessed, I fear, you know? Um, and also used vehicle prices, the same thing. Yeah. The yeah. Used, used vehicle prices and, going and, up. And let's be let's let's bring it back to the Bronco, right? So we paid $63,000 for that Bronco, but, but keep in mind, guys, you know, as much as we like to be the average truck and car buyer, right, because that's how we like to review cars, we are not. It's a business. So for us, you know, to buy a vehicle is a business expense, it's like it's like you know a restaurant buying a fryer because they need to you know to produce more or french fries, fries or yeah. whatever it is right it, it's a business expense so so that's a, it's a whole different world so so and same thing with other youtubers right if youtubers are buying new new vehicles it's because they're trying to create more excitement uh, to have more clicks, to have more reasons for people to come to their YouTube channel, uh, and so these are these these are business decisions, uh, and that's a whole different world. And maybe people are looking at like like us and other YouTubers and thinking, well, you know, we're giving them like the permission to go and buy these very expensive vehicles, uh, and that's creating this kind of atmosphere of like they're doing, everybody's doing it. But I, I would just say, like I said, you know, when I personally buy a vehicle. Uh, and I'm lucky that I don't have to because obviously we have a whole fleet of vehicles here. But when I was buying vehicles personally, you know, I, I would keep that vehicle not a year, but five, five years, ten seven, years. ten yeah. years. Uh, and that was a, you know, a once in a decade decision. And I th- fought long and hard 
about it and I wanted to get the very best price. Uh, and I, and I, I see that kind of returning. I, I don't think it's going to be like, hey, I've got 2500 three years ago at the LA Auto Show, take it. And, I, you know, I, I don't know how you do that. Even now, I don't know how you do that. I, 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 even as a business decision, we thought about, you know, get, putting a reservation on a Rivian. But because, you know, we need that money to make more money, having Rivian sit on $2,500 for what's going to be three years was not doable for us. Yeah, totally, and and, and that's why rent, you know. <laughs> well, that's why we're doing this show too, yeah. because we want to let you guys know what it's like to own a Bronco, so you guys can actually make a decision: Do you want to buy a Bronco? Do you not want to buy a Bronco? Do you want to buy a Jeep? And which Bronco do you buy? Because uh, there are several other more affordable choices you can get in the Bronco lineup. And speaking of that, like I said, bringing back the Bronco, uh, you know, if I know anything about Stellantis. Uh, I still can't have a hard time with that name. Gosh, yeah. uh, it's that uh, you know they often compete on price, uh, and so uh, right now, once again, everything is topsy turvy. There's no chips, there's no supply, but give it a few months, a few quarters maybe, uh, and I think you will see prices on Wranglers come down because Jeep can't like immediately add uh, a feature that the Bronco has. Right? I was talking to the Nissan guys. Uh, an engineer, I think you were there, yeah. and I was talking about the fact that like Honda took away the volume button on their vehicles, and everybody hated it. And then so, they brought it back in yeah, a and year I, or something? And I said, how long, if you figure out that something is so hated that you have to bring it back, will it take, right? And they said, if it's that critical, first of all, it's almost impossible to do, because once the tooling is done, you cannot like stop and, and redo it. It costs a lot of money. But you're looking at years. Millions of dollars. Yeah, yeah. And, and hundreds of millions of dollars. Just change something stupid like changing you know, the volume knob to an actual knob versus a, a touch feely thing. Slider. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so Jeep can't like all of a sudden say, hey, you know, we want to have... Tomorrow we'll have power seats. Right, exactly. Or yeah. Yeah, we whatever. Can, yeah, they can't, they can't do that. But yeah. what they can do certainly is they can make the, the Wrangler cheaper. And I think they've got a lot of leeway there because they're going to be. I think they're on track to sell like a quarter million, which is incredible. Yeah. So congratulations, Jeep. That's that's. If you had told me ten years ago that you're going to sell a quarter million Wranglers a year, I would have like laughed. I would have been done that skeptical journalism thing. <laughs> but <there laughs> but they are doing it. They're doing it. Yeah. 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 All right, guys. Well, so, well, there you have this episode of. Uh, I was going to say. Uh, Talking trucks, <laughs> but we've <laughs> talked to everything. So now it turned into truck on, right? <laughs> I'm car. sorry, it's because I'm here. Uh, but if you're if you're interested in uh, finding out more about the Bronco, we're putting up a lot more videos. They'll be over at TFL uh, Off Road, uh, and some will be over at TFL Car. Uh, TikToks as well. Uh, and uh, I want to once again thank our Patreon patrons. Thank yes. you guys for helping us support. If you want to help support us, Patreon slash TFL Car. Uh, thank you to Onyx. Thank Maps. You, thank you to Onyx. Uh, TFL is a code if you want 20% off an annual membership. And finally, and most importantly, thank you to Tim and the Ronald McDonald House. If you've got uh, a charity that you're looking to support, I couldn't think of a better one. There you go. Uh, yeah, and I, I've been, uh, I've seen uh, friends or I had friends being helped by the Ronald McDonald House. This is really real and it's really helpful. So thank you guys for listening and we'll see you same time, same station next week. Very Ciao. soon.